I think it was the John Pope 23rd who said the following, it is easier for a father to have children than for children to have a real father. We live in a generation that it's not hard to have children. It's just very hard for children to find their dad. There's three, eight types of dads and my professor in seminary, uh, Chris Hippie in uh, New Testament um, overview shared this and I want to share this with you. Eight types of dads, the missing in action man. And he's the one who died or was sick or unable, not, to re not due to rejection, but due to loss. And he just walk, he didn't walk away from your life. It's just life and circumstances took him. The second type of dad is the deadbeat dad. This is the guy who walked away out of rejection, left you. Um, the addicted dad, he's the one who medicates himself and has no room for anyone else because he's busy pursuing pretty much his own pursuit of addiction. The Mr. Nice guy, this guy is tender, loving, kind, warm, never has a conflict, never corrects, and never actually disciplines and instructs his children. He's just a Mr. Nice guy. The selfish dad, and this is the dad who's more known for his golf, his hobbies, and to be with his kids. The party hardy pop. Everyone loves him. Nobody respects him. He's immature. He's the life of the party. It's just he's never home. The domineering dad, and his, this is the guy who's overbearing, intimidating, bullying, heavy probably into military sports or business very driven and has unrealistic expectations for his children and kids are never enough for him they will never ever measure up to him and he makes sure that they know that and of course for the purpose of preparing them for the real world and then there's the good dad he's not perfect but he's present he apologizes he listens he cares and he tries. I like what Max Lucato said. He says, my father didn't do anything unusual. He only did what dad's supposed to do. He was just there. In the Bible, many men were better at many things except as fathers. We see Adam, he was the father of a human race. His son killed Abel. Now we don't know how well his parenting was and it was con whether it contributed to that directly or not we know that he committed sin and we know that that sin led to sin in human race. Abraham was a good father to Ishmael until he sent him away and his mother away. He had a good relationship with Isaac. Isaac he preferred Esau over Jacob causing family conflict. Jacob showed favorism to Joseph causing hatred among his other sons and then he had no discipline over his sons leading to violence and deception. Joseph he cared for his sons Ephraim and Manasseh bringing them to Jacob for a blessing. Job he prayed for his children regularly concerned about their spiritual well-being. Moses, he neglected to circumcise his sons, endangering them spiritually. Eventually, he sent his son and wife away while leading Israel out of Egypt. Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, he was a spiritual leader and the priest of Midian. He advised Moses wisely on managing the people. Eli, his sons were corrupt and he didn't correct them. Samuel, his sons didn't follow his righteous ways, leading to Israel demanding a king. Jesse was the father of David, a family man who cared for his sons in battle. David loved his children but failed to discipline them properly, leading to great tragedy. Solomon, despite his wisdom and wealth, his son Reboam didn't listen to the wise counsel and eventually his heart turned away from God by his pagan wives. Hezekiah was the righteous king but his son Manasseh was the most evil king that Judah had. Joseph was Jesus' stepdad spiritual man, sensitive to the messages from God, obedient and cared for our Lord Jesus. Jesus, he didn't have biological children but he showed the way to all of us about the Heavenly Father. Paul, though we don't see him having children but he was a spiritual father to many, urged others to imitate him as he imitated Christ. This morning as I usually fulfill my uh, baby duties in the mornings, and you know, I've always had a control of my morning schedule for the last 20 years of my life. Nobody has ever had the power to change that. When I married my beautiful wife, you know, she 
brought some adjustment in my life, definitely complimented me in many areas, challenged me in few, but it was never very drastic. Nobody ever messed with my morning schedule unless I gave them permission to. Until a little Samuel came into my life and without saying a word, simply messed the whole thing up at first threw a challenge at me and you know I am a very I consider myself a very disciplined person and I am a morning person and I particularly like my way to be done my way especially first three hours of the day I don't want nobody to mess with it it's the way I do it it's the way I connect with God it's the way I get replenished and renewed and now having somebody else in that space whose needs are more important than my spiritual needs it seems has been a little bit of an adjustment but at the same time it's been a friendly reminder of what it means to walk with God not just by my rules and my rhythm but by having a heart relationship with God and I always am reminded of how a gift this little baby is how a gift he is and I like what our president long president long ago he was a president Theodore Roosevelt he said there are many kinds of success in life worth having it is exceedingly interesting and attractive to be successful businessman or a rail, railway man or farmer or a successful lawyer or doctor or a writer or a president or a ranchman or a colonel of a fighting regiment or kill grizzly bears or lions. That's something probably John will do. But for unflattering interest and enjoyment, a household of children, if things go reasonably, reasonably well, certainly makes all other forms of success and achievement lose their importance by this comparison. I'm going to share with you five things God expects of godly fathers. Maybe you are here today and you cannot have children for biological reasons. This is not to discourage you. You can still be a spiritual father even if you don't expect children anymore and you kind of settle that matter. I know what it's like Father's Day for 13 years and so just, just take confidence that God can still use you. Don't, don't sweat over it. Put it in God's hands and move forward being a blessing to other people. Maybe you are here today and you recently lost a child or your child isn't doing well. This is not a message to pin every point to say this is why you have this thing in your life because you were a bad father. Even if you were a bad father, living in guilt and shame doesn't make you a better one. You got to change, move on and you got to start making amends and start doing the right things today and God will have grace on your family. Amen. <laughs> Disclaimer, I'm not an expert. I have no idea what I'm doing, but I found out no one does. I have never met a father who said they knew what they were doing. If they did, they're lying. Because parenting and being a father, you learn on the job. You can read a lot of books and I've read books, I've studied, prepared for this, even for this message, studied the scriptures. But at the same time, this is nothing, this is completely new. And you learn by being a father. The same way with prayer. You, you learn prayer by praying. <laughs> you learn God's Word by reading God's Word. You don't learn it by just being in a classroom. You learn by actually being and doing that. The first thing I want to highlight today is this. A godly father needs to know the heavenly father. The term father appears 65 times in the synoptic gospels and over 100 times in the gospel of John. A contrast to only 15 times in the Old Testament. So 165 times the word father is mentioned in the gospels and only 15 times in the Old Testament. Why is that? Because the revelation of God, not just the creator, Yahweh, Adonai, Alpha, the Omega, beginning and the end, you know, Prince of Peace, the King of Kings, but the father revelation is huge to our relationship with God, which then becomes a reflection to us reflecting that on the children. Every man in this room who has children, you're, you're just like a moon. You're a big, no, small ball of dirt. And the only light you shine is the light you reflect. The light you mirror from Heavenly Father. I'm pretty sure not one person in this room doesn't have some kind of a father wound. Even if your dad was godly and perfect, they still couldn't 
fill 100% of all of your emotional needs because they're not God. And your relationship with God the Father and having an encounter with the love of God, having the encounter with the love of God does something to you that no book and no sermon will ever do. It heals you on the deepest level and allows you to love in the way you couldn't love by yourself. I grew up in a very, very good godly home. Uh, you know, I'm the oldest of five, which simply means I'm a mini parent before even I got married. You know, if those of you who are the oldest in your family, you're like a mini parent. After there's many kids, you pretty much begin to be a guard, their guardian. And so I grew up in that and I'm very fortunate. I was taught biblical ways, not only from the mouth, but also by the lifestyle. I've seen how my parents lived their faith. And my dad, like a lot of Ukrainian, Russian dads and American dads as well. He is very hardworking. The smartest guy I know personally, the, who has the greatest memory. He has a better memory probably than Chad GPT. <laughs> but my dad is not necessarily very emotional. Now we grew up, you know, being provided for and cared for. And as I started to grow up, when I joined ministry, went into ministry, there was a sense I carried and it's not that my dad gave me that, I, I developed that. What I felt that I wasn't receiving affirmation from him for doing ministry. And I started to fish for that affirmation and for that fatherly love specifically toward being affirmed for my decision to be in ministry. And I felt like he didn't approve of that. He never said it. He didn't say anything otherwise. Just I felt that I'm saying my feelings. And so what I started to do at the age of 24, I recognize that I'm feeling this, this emptiness. And of course, I'm 24. I'm a youth pastor. I'm not going to tell my dad, hey, dad, do you like me? That's weird. Like, that's just, hey, dad, do, do you think I made it? I don't know. I just, it's just, that's not a relationship I have with my dad where we talk about our feelings. At least not at that stage of my life. And so I remember one time my dad went and, you know, his favorite store is Lowe's and Home Depot. So he came back from Lowe's and he was telling me about uh, how he actually told our whole family how he was he encountered this uh, cashier. I still remember her name. Her name was Nicole. I remember every detail about the conversation. That probably was just another conversation for my dad. But that conversation exposed something that I had. I had a problem. And my father said, hey, there was this cashier and her name is Nicole. And, and she looked at my card and she recognized that, you know, her last name is Savchuk. And, and I know where the story goes. She watches my sermons and my dad needs to say that I am so proud, son, that you made our name known in Tri-Cities. I'm fishing for them. Now, my dad doesn't finish with that. He just keeps on going on on how great his last name is. You know, and I'm sitting there, I'm like, yeah, it is great, but that's not why Nicole recognized you in Lowe's. It wasn't because you're frequent there, it's because she's watching the messages and that I think this is time at the age of 24, since 16 to 24, I don't, do, I don't do drugs, I don't drink, I don't do all of this stuff that I can get a, like a little bit of a, like I'm not proud or arrogant, but from a dad, this just means a lot. And that never came. This is embarrassing to admit. It broke something in me. After that, for the next few years, I became obsessed to earn my father's approval on his terms. Now, my dad is incredible at building and fixing things. He, he, I think sometimes he's a magician because he can walk into a room and if something is broken, it starts working. I've seen this with my own eyes. <laughs> Microwave doesn't work. My dad walks in, it works. I've seen this in Ukraine, I see this here. So if some, for those of you who have stuff that's not working, give him a try. <laughs> so what I decided, my dad is building a house and I decided I'm gonna go help him build. Now, construction comes as easy for me as preaching for some of you. It just doesn't come very well. And so, and I made a decision. It wasn't just helping my dad. I was there to help my dad while trying to hope to earn some kind of an approval. And every time I tried to help him, I messed everything up. I remember clearly he bought these specific tiles from Lowe's and they were limited quantity. He wanted every bathroom to look a little bit different or maybe it was a discount uh, situation that they were on discount. I'm not sure what it was, design or discount, but 
He doesn't live in the house anymore. He sold it now. And so I remember he said, hey, you can go and cut the tile. And I, so I went in, I, I went to cut the tile. I mean, it's not hard. I've done it before. And so I go in and you know, there's a particular way. And, and I broke every piece of tile to the point that we no longer could lay that tile in that bathroom because I messed it up. And, and I remember my dad kicking me out out of his construction project. And he says, hey, just go back to church. <laughs> and that hurt me very, very deeply. Not in a way that it was abusive. But see, I'm 24 and I'm fishing for that for my dad. Too afraid to admit that I need it. And I don't want it to come because I told him, hey dad, could you send something my way? We get married with my wife and we are at a Japanese sushi place in Kenwick eating uh, sushi. Not a big sushi fan, but I love my wife. I'm willing to eat stuff that she eats. We go to a sushi place and this particular restaurant, they bring you appetizers. And this appetizer, now I'm used to the Olive Garden appetizers. You eat the appetizer and you never order the meal. <laughs> and so I'm excited. I'm like, I'm just going to get one sushi, one roll of sushi, and I'm just going to get one unlimited salad. And so, and I got salad for appetizer and they brought salad. And, and I saw from the distance, big bowl. I'm like, I, I got excited. My stomach got excited. As they bring that bowl to the table, I looked inside. I could count how many leaves they had there. I think it was about eight. With a sp some kind of a sprinkle of some kind of a sauce on it. And I, and I looked at that and I looked at my wife and I said, well, what is this? What is this, decoration? She's like, oh, that's your salad. I said, that's not a salad, that's an insult on humanity. I was like, how are they even operating as a business providing, this is an appetizer? What, $15.99? They probably picked that from the backyard and just put it in and then somebody just sprayed something over it. And my wife said something that the Lord used to heal me the next day. And this is what she said. She says, an appetizer is not supposed to replace the main meal. It's supposed to prepare you for the main meal. I said, well, somebody needs to tell that to Olive Garden. <laughs> anyway, finished eating sushi. I'm upset. I'm not happy. Next morning I come right here to church. And the Holy Spirit uses that phrase and He says, your father is an appetizer. I'm the entree. He said, your father was never meant to be the entree. He was supposed to prepare you for me. He said, what you are looking, you will not find in your dad. You can only find in me. And right there at this altar, where many of you have encountered the Lord, I encountered the love of God in such a way, something like a dam broke and the flood of the Father's love. I've met God before, I've encountered His presence, but this way I've encountered a liquid love that drowned me. It healed something on such a deep thing that I sh have to expect more out of Him, less out of my dad. My dad did the best that he could. He was a good dad. This is not to say that fathers shouldn't, couldn't do better. But something changed after that. I no longer sought that from my father. Now I was looking for opportunities to honor my dad. Not to fish for something from him. And this was crazy. Where my father builds another house and I get a chance to come alongside. And I started to cut tiles. My tile cutting skills improved. My dad, who's not very verbal, not very, very affirmative, it's just, just the way he is, very hardworking, very loyal, very Christian-like. My dad and my mom, something happened and this is a miracle. I was in California preaching at the Revival Youth Center Sacramento. I didn't even know the church had live stream. When the service ended, I received a text message. This was about like eight or something or seven years ago. And I received a text message. So the first miracle is my dad texted. Right now, he texts all the time. Seven years ago, that was a miracle. <laughs> Number two, and I received a text message and this wasn't, hey, about this and that. This is for the first time in my life, I received a very long descriptive message of how my father said, I watched the message. Me and my mother were both in tears and we're so proud you are our son. Now, I never asked him to send me that. 
I never asked him what he thought about it. And what I realized that day, of course, I broke down reading that message and somebody thought I had a, like a family crisis. That's why I'm crying. I said, no, 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 this is different kind of crisis. This is, this is, I, I can't believe this, this is my dad. Did somebody hack his phone? Is this, I'm like, even if somebody did, I love that message and I'm going to treasure that. I no longer needed that. But it was a confirmation that once God heals your heart, you encounter the Father's love, your attitude toward your dad changes. And a lot of times that changes their response toward you as well. The first thing as a man you got to do, if you didn't have a father in your life, and maybe you're here today and you're like, how can I be a father if I didn't see a good one? You simply skipped appetizer, you went straight for the entree. Receive the Father's love from heaven. Encounter His love because He loves you. You didn't come from your dad, you came through your dad. Even if he walked away or maybe he, he died or maybe something happened between him and your mom and you just end up in the middle because when elephants fight, grass suffers and you suffered from that and today you're saying, I'm a broken man. Yes, but if you encounter God, you can be a healed man. If you encounter the Holy Spirit, you can be a whole man. You can have a future and you don't have to live out of the brokenness for your family and continue the cycle of curse and brokenness. Can somebody say amen? I will be a father to you. 2 Corinthians 6, 18 says, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. I want to speak that over somebody in this room today who has maybe not had a father in your life and God says, I will be a father to you. Maybe your father already passed on. You're like, man, I wish I could have my dad with me today. You can experience the father's love. God says, I will be a father to you. Listen, young lady, I will be a father to you. Amen. Number two, a godly father has the power to break the cycle inherited from previous generations. Ezekiel 18:14 it says, if however he begets a son who sees all the sins which his father has done and considers and does not do likewise. Do not believe a lie of the devil that just because your dad was a womanizer, you will be a womanizer. No, you're a bloodline curse breaker. You will break the cycle in your family. A man who saw his father do sin and then he considered and said, no, that's not how I'm going to live. I'm going to reflect the nature and the character of my father and does not do the meaning. He can make a decision. I will not be like that. Not in anger, not in resentment, but in a response to the word of God. Isaiah 58, 12. Those from among you shall build the old waste places. Come on somebody. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. Maybe the previous generations broke the foundation. Maybe they laid your family tree into a way, waste, but you're stepping in into the blessing of Abraham and God is prophetically speaking over you. You will replace, you will repair, you will build a new family tree for your family. You are a curse breaker. You can't control your dad's past example, but you choose your environment. Today you can place yourself in an environment where you can learn from other fathers, from Heavenly Father. You're not responsible for what your father passed on to you, but you are responsible for what you let pass through. You're not responsible for what you have seen, but you are responsible for what you're going to do about it. Generational curses work like this. A previous generation hands you a loaded gun. It is your decision to pull the trigger. Or you don't have to pull the trigger. You can remove the magazine and eject the chambered round. You can stop that in its tracks. Don't believe this lie and don't use it as an excuse. Well, because my dad did it, I have to do it. It might be a reason, but it's not an excuse. It might be a reason why it's harder for you to model fathering and, and being a great husband and to be a responsible man. It might be a reason, but it cannot be an excuse because God will give you the grace you need to break those curses and set a new blessing for your family. 
Amen? As long as you're blaming your dad for why you're a lousy dad, you won't break the blood, bloodline curses in your family. As long as you're blaming your dad why you are struggling today, you will never break any curses. Blaming doesn't solve it. It's battling those mindsets, patterns and attitudes. When we bought a duplex in Richland, this is a while ago when we just got married a year into it, we inherited a, a duplex. It was pretty run down, it was like a drug house. One side of it was a drug house and the yard was not kept. It wasn't maintained. So when I bought the place, blaming the previous owner didn't fix my yard. The only reason I had a bad yard is because the guy before me wasn't good at maintaining it. You know what I had to do? Kill weeds, plant seeds and do some mowing. But blaming, walking around and saying, oh, he was such a terrible owner. He was such a terrible person. That didn't fix my yard. You cannot live in pity, blame, shame and all of that. All you got to do is you got to pull weeds plant seeds, kill snakes, mow that yard and keep on working. Why? Because you are a bloodline curse breaker. You will break the cycle and you will create a new line for your family. You will be a blessing to your family tree. Amen. Number three, a godly father must first be a godly man. Frank Pittman said, fathering is not something perfect men do but something that perfects the man. A Pew Research study of 130 countries shows that USA has the highest rate of children in single parent households. Now, some of us, this is not new, but what shocked me, United States has 23% of children without fathers living with them. Do you know what the global average is 7%? Did you know that China has 3%, Nigeria 4%, India 5%, United States is 23%. United States rate is three times higher than the global average, three times higher. Do you know what the two causes are for why we have fatherlessness? The first cause is divorce. The second cause is out of wedlock births. So the real cause for fatherlessness is that men aren't men. Men are boys. Because you can't be a godly father if you're not a godly man. You're born as a male. You become a boy. And hopefully you had a male in your life who helped you to transition out of boyhood through rite of passage into manhood. In Jewish culture they do it at 13. Some cultures they do it at 14, some cultures they do it at 12 where they help a boy to re recognize you are becoming a man and you need a male figure in your life. Sometimes it's a dad, sometimes it's a coach, sometimes it's a small group leader, but somebody that walks alongside and helps you to be a man. And to be a man doesn't mean that you, you have sex. To be a man doesn't mean you go and drive crazy or do drugs. To be a man means you endure suffering. You delay gratification. You live your life like it's not about you. You live your life like you're not the center of the universe. You begin to embrace maturity because a maturity is really denying yourself and begin to embrace living for other people. And as you live as a godly man, then you become a husband. You're a good husband. Why? Because you were a great man. It's easy to endure difficulties of marriage because you've, you've endured the challenges of what it means to be a man. And then when you are a good husband, it's easier to become a good father because you've been a good husband and you've been a great man. What we have today is this, is we have a boy skips all of that and goes into a father. You don't become a father because you made somebody pregnant. It just simply means you have semen that works. That's all. This doesn't mean you have maturity. You got to be a good man first. And to be a good man is not that you got muscles. I work out, got a muscle car, I got a bike. I'm macho. That's not necessarily being a good man. And if Andrew Tate is your example of what it means to be a good man, you're in trouble. If your example of what it means to be a good man is a comedy which simply paints men as dumb, stupid, always at home, never responsible, never taking care of anything, slow spiritually, playing video games, pretty much a goof, a joke. 
That's not a definition of masculinity. In the Bible, 1 Kings 2.2, David said to his young man, Solomon, he says, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong therefore and prove yourself a man. And keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in His ways and to keep His statutes, His commandments, His judgments and His testimonies as it's written in the law of Moses that you may prosper in all that you do and whenever you turn. Here is a man's man, kills giants and he looks at his son Solomon and he says, he doesn't just say, hey, be a great king. He doesn't say, hey, be a great father. He knows that the secret to being a good father and being a great king is to be a good man. And he's charged to Solomon. He says, show yourself a man. Be a good man. You're like, well, so how do I become a man? Do I sign up to a gym? Do I, you know, join a marathon? And he says this, keep the statues of the Lord. Keep God's commandments, fear God. And he says, and you will prosper because every man wants to prosper. Every man wants to feel like his life has a meaning. There's a sense of legacy. I left a mark on this world. I fulfilled God's responsibility that he placed on me. And David says, who killed Goliath, he was a man's man. He looks at his son and he says, be a good man. Obey God and you will prosper. Don't try to be a good father. First, be a good man because good men love their wives. Good men will care for their children. You don't have to be a great man, a good man. And that's what is lacking in our generation. A good man doesn't have sex with somebody he's not married to. A good man doesn't have children if he's not ready to father them. A good man obeys God's Word and God's Word says that marriage is to be holy and honorable and not to be yoked unequally. A good man honors God's Word and something begins to happen. He has children when he has a wife. And then when he has a wife, he takes responsibility for his children. Why? Not because he's super duper spiritual. He's a good man. Kids don't need mighty dads. They just need good men. And we have a shortage of good men. You can speak in tongues and not be a good man. You can even attend the church and not be a good man. Boys in the male body, we need to graduate from boyhood into manhood. A boy is passive, man is assertive. Boy lives for a moment, a man plans for the future. A boy looks for a girlfriend, a man looks for a wife. A boy speaks, a man acts. A boy is possessive, but a man is protective. Boy plays games, a man shoulders responsibilities. A boy tells others, he's a man. A man quietly lives it. A boy, he makes experiences. It's all about experiences. A man makes progress. A boy makes demands, a man serves. A boy lies, cheats and deceives. A man is a man of integrity. His word is his bond. If he says it, you can count on it. You cannot be a good father if you're not a good man. And the Bible focuses so much. That's, that's why there's so little verses on being a good father. There's a lot of verses on being a good man. Because if you're a good man, the qualities that made you a good man will be the qualities that will help you to be a good father. You're a male by birth, but you're a man by choice. Amen. Number four, a godly father must turn his heart toward his children. Malachi chapter 4 verse 6, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the earth with the curse. I was meditating this week and I realized that in Ten Commandments, God said, people who hate God, it will be the iniquities of the fathers going on their children. I find that interesting. The Bible doesn't say iniquities of the mother. It's the iniquity of the father. As a father, you have a, such an impact that God says you can pass an iniquity or you can pass an integrity. You have such an impact on your life. You carry such, a, you might feel like you have no influence. You might not have no influence on social media. You might not even be on social media. You're like, I don't care about that stuff. And that's completely fine. If you have children, you have influence. Because these children, they look up to you and you have influence. In the late 1990s, in a national park in South Africa, 
there were too many elephants in Kruger National Park. And young elephants were relocated to this another park in South Africa. And what begins to happen is the young elephants were left at this park because older ones were put into a different park. Young elephants without, young male elephants without having older male elephants around them started to, for no reason, attack rhinos and kill them. Now elephants, if you know anything about elephants, they do not attack unless they're provoked. Without any provocation, young elephants begin to exhibit violence against other animals and start to kill them. And what they did is they started to study their behavior and what they did is they brought some older male elephants back into the fold and all of that violence stopped. And they came to this conclusion that young males need mature older masculine men in animal kingdom and we need that in our human kingdom as well to guide the way because if you do not have young men having older men in their presence they begin to exhibit violence and no restraint to their emotions children who grew up with fathers this is what the insights tell us from the america first Policy Institute. They're less likely to be poor. Fatherlessness, fatherless families are four times more likely to live in poverty. 84% of fatherless families are headed only by a woman. There is no father. Father, your presence in the family decreases the family's chance of living in poverty drastically. You're a carrier of prosperity for those children. Children who grew up with fathers are less likely are more likely to succeed in schools. Children with engaged dads do better in schools. 33% less likely to repeat a class. 43% less, 43 more likely to get an A. 71% of high school dropouts are from fatherless homes. They are more likely to avoid jail. Fatherless kids are 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. Department of Justice found out that 39% of all inmates lived in a mother-only household during the time of their incarceration. They're less likely to suffer from substance abuse. Children without dads are 10 times more likely to abuse substances, with 71% of all substance abusing children coming from fatherless homes. They're less likely to be sexually promiscuous. Girls whose fathers left before age of five are eight times more likely to get pregnant as teens. Involved fathers have twice the influence as mothers in reducing teen sexual activity. So when you're a young woman and you're looking for a man, don't just look for a husband. Look right away for a father. Ask yourself this question, do I want my kids to be like this person? And the second question you need to ask is this person, not only do they like me, can they stay if they don't like me? Is this person a man? Is this person is able to stick around? Why? Because all of the world that you are managing is greatly affected by the influence of that man. Less likely to be involved in violent crime. 70% of youth in state facilities come from single parent homes. 63% of youth suicides and 85% of behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. In 56 school shootings in the United States, 82% of shooters grew up without a dad. Children without dads are 279% more likely to carry guns and deal drugs. They are less likely to suffer from mental illness or mental problems. Children in single parent homes are twice as likely to have mental health and behavior problems. Now this is not in any way today to cast shadow for those of you who maybe you're single mom and you feel maybe just even heavier by this, this is not the point, but this is to remind you the role that dads play and to encourage the men in this room that you are valuable. You may not feel that. Your presence carries so much effect on your kids. Kids who have dads in their home are less likely to be obese. Children in father absent homes have a higher risk of obesity. Studies found the father's body mass index is directly related to the children's activity level and overall fitness. 
They're more likely to develop broader vocabulary. Fathers who play a crucial role in the verbal development of their children. Research suggests that fathers, not mothers, have a significant influence on child's vocabulary by using more unfamiliar words, thus broadening their verbal skills and overall happiness and health. A grand study found that a loving father's imparted many benefits to their sons including enhanced play capacity, enjoyment of vacations, humor as coping mechanism, better life adjustment after retirement and less anxiety under stress. As a father, in which way can we turn our heart toward the children? Number one, love their mother. And maybe you're here today and you and the mother of your children are not together. Stuff happened before you came to Christ. You can still show respect for the mother of the children. For those of you who are married and the mother of your children is your wife, the greatest gift you give to your children is to love your wife. You want them to grow up seeing that as an example, not hearing that as a lecture. Number two is we love and care for them like God loves and cares for us. Number three is we provide for them. Number four is we instruct them in the ways of righteousness. It is not kids' own responsibility to teach your children. It is not the government's responsibility to teach your children. It is not the public school's responsibility to teach your children to fear God. It is not their job. It is yours. You might say, but I'm not a Bible teacher. You can read. Your children are not looking for a theologian. They're looking for a dad who knows the truth about God's Word and guides them in that path. Discipline them. Disciplining will look differently at different ages. And I'll mention that in just a moment. But children do need to be corrected. A dad who simply says that love means things are never said no is unpreparing them for the future because life is not as nice as you are. And lastly, don't provoke them to anger. And this is huge. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 it says, And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. I was in youth ministry from 16 to 30. I want to share with you my personal 10 things not to do as a father. From what I've learned in the youth ministry, listening to kids whose parents and mainly dads messed them up. The first one, don't act like you're their God. You're just their guardian. This is a note for myself, okay? So nobody feel personally attacked. Because if somebody like, man, did my kid tell you to say that? There's a very high chance. <laughs> Number two, don't speak death over your child. You're stupid. You're not good enough. Don't speak death over your child. If you want to reap death, speak death. Speak life to your child. Number three, don't ever, ever hit your child. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. That's demonic. That's not biblical. You cannot hit your child. That's abuse and that's, that's illegal and that's immoral. Number three, don't spank, spank your child with your hand. Why? You don't use your hand to drive out nails, drive in nails. You use a hammer, you use a tool. Why? Because your hands are not supposed to drive in nails. Your hands are not a tool of punishment. That's why you gotta, if you do believe in spanking your children at a particular age and that only is supposed to be used after all correction methods have failed, not as your first outbreak of correcting any small thing, but if you ever do use that, you have to use a tool there has to be things that have to be explained, not in anger, and it can never be your hand. Why? Because your hand is supposed to show love, care, not punishment. To so those who walk around slapping their kids or hitting them with, with their hand, you, the Bible says to use the rod, not a hand. Your hand is for love. Your hand is for nurture. Your hand is for guidance. You can use the belt or whatever, depending on what your policy is in the family. But the biggest thing is most kids don't have a problem with even spanking. I remember growing up as a kid, I know my parents believe in spanking like 100%. <laughs> now the way my mom spanked us and the way my dad spanked us, and I can say this because they're already a lot older. My mom spanked us in anger. <laughs> and I never liked my mom when she was spanking me. I actually resented her. When you spank your child or discipline your child in anger, you make them hate you instead of what they did. My dad never spanked us in anger. My dad was so confusing that when we did something wrong, he was never emotional about it. He would sit us down, explain things to the point I felt the wrath of God passed over. 
And I'm like, okay, because you know, you're looking at their face, they're so calm and everything, he's talking. I'm like, my mom will never, like if she's that calm, ain't gonna see the belt for a long time. So I'm seeing my dad and I'm so comfortable there. And my dad's like, so now, so how many, uh, uh, you know, I'm like, what do you mean how many? Uh, we're good, right? He's like, oh yeah, we're very good. You're not good. <laughs> and then my dad would give me some, some spanking. And this is the thing, when he did it, I was always disappointed with what I did. I was never mad at him because they knew the way he explained it, the way he presented and it was always for rebellious behavior, not for a mistake. You don't spank a child for a mistake. We all make mistakes, but for rebellious attitude. When I received that, and that, that was huge. Number five, never compare your child to your other child. Don't compare your child to, your, to their cousin. Do not compare your child to somebody else you would want them to be in. That is one of the best ways to destroy your family. I've seen parents in our church compare their child to me. Those children hated me <laughs> and they hated their parents. I know you might want to be inspired by somebody else's kid. God didn't give you that kid. Raise them to be who God created them to be. Do not compare them. Joseph did that. Other people played favoritism in, in their family. It deeply bruised those children. It n n destroys their self-esteem. Don't use the scripture against your children. Honor your father and your mother during a conflict. This is annoying. It's like when you cannot, you see things are not happening and then you're throwing in scripture and then the punishment with it. This is what's gonna happen to you. Really? No, maybe the reason why this is happening is because you have not been honoring to your father and mother. Do not throw the scripture when there is a disagreement and your child is processing what you're correcting them and there's attitudes and everything. This is not a moment to beat them with the Bible. The Bible isn't a refuge where you come in because you have no more argument. Let's beat them with the Bible. That's not, it doesn't help the child. It actually helps them to hate the Bible, not love the Bible. When during an argument or when you're correcting a child to constantly just, just berail them with that one verse. I, I know parents, they do not know any verse in the Bible except two. Beat the child with the rod and make sure you honor me. Number seven, this applies to Hungry Jen. Don't tell your child they have a demon when they disagree with you. <laughs> Disagreeing with an adult is not a sign of demonization. Number eight, don't tell them they will reap what they sow when they don't listen to you. Because most likely you're the one that's reaping what you've sown. I know anger, frustration, and I've seen this poured out on children. I've seen this poured out on me. You will see one day, you will weep. Really? Why, why do you want to speak that over your child? Aren't you glad God didn't let you reap everything you sown? We all need mercy. And your child needs mercy as well. And they need grace. Number nine, don't make your child take responsibility for your emotions. When you make your child, you say, look what you did. You made me, you made me sad. If you're sad, it's because you're sad. Don't ever make your child be responsible for your emotional roller coaster. You're an adult. Manage your emotions. It is not a little child's, even a 12 year old's responsibility to carry the weight of your emotional mayhem. And penalizing them will say, look how you made me, look I'm crying now because even if your child is drinking and, and they're completely disobeying God, do not project your emotions on them. They're dealing with whatever demons they're dealing with. That's not, their responsibility isn't to pick up more of your baggage. They need to grow on their own. They need to figure that out. You may process that with God, with your spouse, but the child should not carry extra weight of an adult's emotions. And lastly, don't treat them like they're kids when they're not kids anymore. Respect their boundaries when they become adults. Their space, knock, don't just barge in into the room. Ask for permission, don't just tell them. And don't treat them like a kid. Because I've seen parents treat their children who already become 21, 20 and they have their own car, they have their own job and they literally treat them like they are toddlers. 
and it breaks those relationships and their hearts aren't turned toward their children as adults and they don't prepare them for adulthood. They don't let them go. They don't release them. They don't make them, uh, they don't allow them to make any mistakes and everything is always hoarded like this, like a helicopter. Just, I'm just going to guard you like this and I'm going to protect you. And these kids grow up ill-prepared for the future. And lastly, a godly father is a spiritual fighter. I want you to rise to your feet. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14. And I looked and arose and I said to the nobles and to the leaders, to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord great and awesome and fight for your brethren, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives and for your houses. So husbands don't fight for your wives, just, just one wife. You can fight for many houses, just one wife. And if you have few wives, I don't know how you do it, but it's not biblical. <laughs> Nehemiah says to the men, to the leaders of households and leaders of communities, don't fear the battle. Don't fear the challenge. Don't fear the difficulty. Some of you, you're a father and it's, it's a uh, blended family. Children that are not your own. And maybe you're afraid today. The challenges, the financial challenges, the emotional challenges, plus you're dealing with your own personal, personal demons maybe. The economy, relationship difficulties and, and Nehemiah is speaking to these men and God is speaking to us today, do not be afraid. A lot of men out of fear, instead of facing the problem, they leave their family, they run and simply live a more convenient and easy life. Yes, it is easier to escape and run, but that's what cowards do. We're not cowards, we're men of God. Do not be afraid. Don't leave your family. Don't leave your marriage. Maybe you experienced loss and one of your children went off into the world or maybe tragically you lost one of your children and death in the family of children usually wrecks the family apart. Be a man of God. Do not be afraid of a fight. Do not be afraid of the enemy that is coming against you. Do not be afraid of the challenges that are coming against you. Do not flee the battle position yourself. You may say, but I don't feel strong, but I don't have what it takes. You might not, but God has you. God is on your side. He's got you. Maybe you got one of your children and they're dealing with a mental illness. And maybe you're dealing with a child that is, has a learning disorder or something and it's really challenging. Perhaps you're dealing with the downsizing at work right now and you're experiencing it and you're like all of this pressure is coming upon me. Relationship responsibilities and my wife and my children and all of these things. God is speaking to the man, be a fighter. You might not be killing a grizzly bear, but you can fight depression. You can fight discouragement. You can fight passivity. You can fight anger. You can fight those things. In the name of Jesus. Don't fear the battle. Don't flee the battle. Don't leave your family high and dry. I know you're gonna make it. I know it's easier to run, but you don't understand I'm under pressure. This is hard. It's harder when you leave. Choose your heart and fight for your family. Trust in your God. He got you. He will sustain you. He will support you. And fight for your wife, not with your wife. Fight for your children, not with your children. You can correct them, discipline, instruct them, love them, care them. But your goal and battle isn't with the children. You're a fighter. Win that fight. You cannot be a great father if you don't have a fight in you. And one of the things that life will teach you, you will either become a fighter or you will flee the battle. Leave the family, leave the kids or check out mentally. Come from work and you say, I don't want to deal with that stuff. I'm just gonna into a video game. I'm just gonna go disappear and numb myself with the golf game, with my buddies when in reality there's a war going on in the family. It's easier to run from a battle than it is to face the battle. But you're a man of God. You are a fighter. Your God is a fighter and He says to you, do not be afraid of a battle. Do not run from the battlefield. Instead, trust in your mighty, awesome God. Remember, He is on your side and go into that battle. Maybe it's hard. Maybe this battle will continue for a decade, but go into the battle because you're a winner through Jesus Christ. I want to congratulate every man that did not walk away, but you stood in that battle. 
Maybe your dad walked away from your family but you're staying and your children are looking at you and you are their hero. Why? Because you, are, you have stayed and you're leading that family. You're pointing your family to Jesus Christ. You are that fighter because you're fearless, because you refuse to give up, you refuse to give in into those problems and you keep pressing in. Victory is on your side. I want you to raise your hands to the Lord. Every man, every father. Lord, I pray that you will bring healing to those today who have experienced fatherlessness, a wound in their heart, who maybe felt an absence of a male figure in their life while growing up. I pray right now that they will experience the love of God in a way that brings healing in the deepest parts of them. Lord Jesus, I ask you that you will help us to be the ones that break cycles of poverty.